for having me give the seminar uh, and letting me discuss my research. Uh, yeah, I'll be talking about NASA satellite data, uh, but I first would like to thank my collaborator, Susan, has, has provided uh, some, some input here, um, and also my collaborators at Argonne National Lab um, for the, most of the funding for this work and uh, for our help on this. So, um, let's get started here. Hopefully this will go. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, all right, so why I study air pollution. Um, so I'm going to be talking about three of the, the most studied air pollutants, fine particulate matter, ozone, and nitrogen dioxide. Um, why do we want to, to look at the concentrations of these? Well, because they impair cardiovascular function, uh, leading to these cardiovascular diseases and premature mortality. Uh, it also causes, all three of these pollutants cause and exacerbate asthma, um, particular NO2, in addition to sulfur dioxide, uh, contributes to acid rains, so that, you know, uh, that harms the ecosystems and also can harm our, our monuments, which is important around here. Um, it impairs natural visibility. Um, and then ozone, in particular, can stunt the, uh, the growth of plants, so this is really important for the agriculture industry. So there's, there's uh, lots of uh, financial losses due to ozone uh, when it comes to growing our food. And then finally, ozone is in uh, greenhouse gas. So it's approximately third, uh, the, uh, the third most important behind uh, carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, but it's really important to note the last part, uh, box on the bottom here. Controlling air pollution in our, our economy costs billions of dollars. So that's with a B, lots of money. But the benefits are actually even larger. So the ratio, the one of our recent EPA studies uh, quantified that the the cost in attaining the ozone standard. So there's many cities in the United States that are not attaining the ozone standard. For them to get into an attainment would be approximately 1.5 billion dollars. So that's a huge cost. But the benefits, the health benefits from that, are on the order of five billion. So uh, it's greater than two. Uh, certainly. So there's a good reason why we want to control our air pollution. Um, let's, there's a recent study called the Global Burden of Disease. They've actually quantified uh, air pollution globally. Um, and I'm just going to sh show the statistics for the United States here. Uh, in the U.S., uh, fine particulate matter, uh, uh, solids suspended in the air, approximate, very, very, very small solids. Are, approximately 88,000, responsible for 88,000 premature deaths. Ozone is approximately 11 to 12,000. Um, if we just do a quick calculation here, there's eight, about 2.8 million deaths, all cause. If we do, uh, if we do this calculation, air, outdoor air pollution is responsible for approximately one in 26 deaths in the United States. I just looked up this morning, what, how many uh, deaths, premature deaths, due to car accidents, and those, that's about 35,000. So okay. outdoor air pollution is about three times, uh, it causes three times more premature deaths than, than car accidents. So that's kind of a good uh, comparison to, to show uh, why we need to control our air pollution. Um, recently, Susan uh, published this paper on looking specifically at asthma incidences globally. Uh, Looking at ozone, approximately, there's error bars here, but approximately 15 million annual asthma emergency room visits globally. Uh, particulate matter, again, the small solids suspended are approximately 5 to 10 million. And the anthropogenic part, so not all air pollution is anthropogenic, but the anthropogenic part is, is a significant fraction of both um, for the ozone and the, the fine particulate matter. So, um, certainly, and this is just on asthma incidents. These aren't uh, emergency room visits. Of course, this doesn't uh, account for daily, you know, asthma attacks that, that where there's no ER visits. Um, there's also an, uh, uh, nitrogen dioxide can also uh, cause or in, uh, cause asthma in addition to exacerbate it. Uh, this is a recent paper published this year by Susan's postdoc boy, um, former postdoc now. Um, she quantified that approximately four million children develop asthma each year globally. Um, you know, this is this images is, is is not weighted based on population. So of course the the, the countries with the largest population have the largest values here. So I won't focus that on that too much, but just the, the overall value that four million cases children develop asthma each year, and and NO2 is probably the easiest pollutant to control. So. 
this, these, can, these are avoided uh, uh, issues that can be avoided with proper control. All right, so that's why you want to study air pollution. Let's get very quickly to the, the chemistry of it. It's going to be very, very brief, very, very uh, high level. So uh, a lot of our air pollution um, is, is, uh, comes from both uh, cars and power plants. This is very generalized here. And they emit NOx. And so any type of high temperature fossil fuel combustion will emit NOx. And so that's a primary pollutant. And you know, you're going to see very high concentrations if you go outside here uh, on the roadway of, of NOx. Um, but in the summertime, there's some complex chemical reactions, which are very generalized here, that um, can create surface level ozone. So you need sunlight. You need some actually emissions from, from trees. Um, and there's some uh, in the form of volatile organic compounds, and that can create ozone. And ozone is, is really what's going to cause uh, the, uh, these poor air quality days. In the summertime, you see an ozone alert or a poor air quality uh, alert. In, in the summer, it's most likely due to surface level ozone. And so this is what's called a secondary pollutant. So it's not emitted from a, from a tailpipe, but it actually uh, reacts in the atmosphere with other pollutants. Uh, also, it can be natural uh, uh, sources and creates ozone. So, we really want to try and control our NOx emissions. So, so how do we typically measure uh, outdoor air pollution? So, actually, three years for three years during my graduate work, I was uh, the primary site operator at this site. It's in Baltimore, Maryland, about a half an hour away from here, on your Baltimore Washington Parkway. And this is actually one of the most comprehensive air quality monitoring sites in the country. Um, it has a bunch of different monitors. So this is what an air quality monitor looks like. It's actually a box. Uh, um, and there's, there's a couple of, of things in there, but it essentially well, it can measure the concentrations of, of air pollution. I can get into the details if people are interested in how it works. But, um, so there's, there's several of these types of boxes that measure the, the gases in the air. And then there's also, at this site, there's a filter paper that actually collects the, um, uh, that collects the particulates and, the, and then it's sent off to a lab and you can you know, see what types of particulates are in the air. Um, we also are collecting at this site, or I, I was collecting and I'm still collecting rainwater. So you collect the rainwater, you ship it off to a lab, you see how much acid rain is falling. And then there's also a couple of, there's this, this uh, what's called the dep deposition monitor here, where you're analyzing the stickiness of the gases. So how quickly is the pollution going into, into the, the grass or the vegetation? Um, so anyways, there's approximately a, a thousand of these sites across the United States. There's six sites within DC city limits. Um, but uh, there are, even though we have a thousand in the United States, which is quite a bit, there, there are gaps in between. And so this is what the, the network approximately it looks spatially across the eastern United States. So there's going to be a lot of monitors near the cities, and not too many monitors where there are no cities, um, which is good and bad, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So the EPA standard for ozone is very complicated. I'm trying to, uh, I've simplified it to what's called an ozone design value, and this is what, what the regulatory agencies call it. Um, and anything above, I know these colors don't particularly show up super well here, but anything in orange and red is above the EPA, current EPA threshold, and anything in red is significantly above the EPA threshold. Um, and that's called moderate non-attainments. These are all lawyer terms that you don't need to know. But anyways, um, you really just want to focus on where is the red and where is the orange. And then also the yellow is, they're just below the the threshold. So, you know, if there's a very a change in standard, a change in pollution, it's very easy to go from yellow to orange, and then you'd be in non-attainment of, of the standard. So, and this is this current year. So, we're still this, this is still an issue uh, across the entire eastern United States in controlling our air pollution. All right. So, here's a, a look at the trends. Um, I, I didn't want to quiz you, but uh, it's, it's sometimes surprising to see that, that the trends in air pollution are actually going down over time. Um, so if I take someone off the street, they might think that the ozone and the air pollution is actually getting worse over time, and it's actually getting better over the last 10, 
actually 30 years really, but here I'm just showing the last 10 years or so. Um, and the interannual variability has to do with two things. Uh, one is the meteorology. So on a very hot year, so 2011 and 2012 were extremely hot years around here, and so therefore the pollution was much higher than the than the mean here. So if we draw a, a line here, you can see obviously that those two years were much higher. Um, and conversely, 2013, 2014 were cooler than average years, so they're going to be below this mean. Um, overall, obviously, you see a decline over time. Um, and this is obviously good news. And in fact, this past year, 2019, this is preliminary data, actually is, is the cleanest overall for the entire eastern United States over the past 30 years, uh, going back at least, since, since the EPA was, has been monitoring those. So this is uh, great news um, that we're, we're getting there. But <coughs> of course, there's still several areas in the eastern United States that are above these, these thresholds. Um, and so that's you know, there's still there's still work, work to be done. Okay, and then let's take a look at air pollution globally. This I just took a quick snapshot this morning of this <coughs> website here. Uh, this data is not quality controlled, so you might see some some weird values some places. That's to be expected. There's some issues with, uh, with these these sensors, but overall you could see the, the general pollution across the the globe here. Um, the United States generally, right now, has pretty good air pollution, uh, uh, low concentrations of, of many pollutants, primarily because it's the winter time and we've had lots of rain around in the eastern United States, so that's really what's driving the green over here. If you look towards China and India, you see obviously higher values um, uh, can be uh, 10 times higher than, than the United States. So, um, you know, this is just, it's just a quick snapshot of what the pollution looks like, but as you can tell, there's several areas where there are no, no monitors, particularly South America, Africa, and uh, Northern Eurasia, Russia area. So um, this is where satellite data can be really helpful, but it can also be helpful in the United States as well, in between the monitors, and, and better quantifying what's going on, you know, even a few kilometers away from, from a monitor where there, there really is um, uh, no actual ground truth data. All right, so what does satellite data, or what do the satellites look like? Um, so there are two types of satellites that are, are currently in orbit. There's one that's a geostationary, and then there's what we call the polar orbiting, where it goes over the poles, but it's really, it's a low, another term is low Earth orbiting. Um, so geostationary stays fixed to one spot over the entire uh, globe, so this would be great for if you wanted say, like to monitor the weather just in the United States, or for example, if you want to spy satellite just in the Middle East, that we'd want a, a <coughs> stationary satellite. For polar orbiting, that's, that's more useful for NASA to, to gather uh, entire global data because it has a snapshot of everywhere over the globe once per day. So it depends on what, you're, what you want to quantify here, but uh, a lot of the satellites for Earth science are actually uh, polar orbiting and low Earth orbiting. and uh, it's great because it gets a global snapshot once per day, but it's also uh, an issue because it only takes a snapshot once per day. So sometimes you won't really want, and ideally you want multiple of these satellites. So you have one polar orbiting and one geostationary. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. All right, so what does NO2 from space look like? So here's an image from a, a new satellite just launched called Tropomi, well, just launched in in, in, uh, in space, in, uh, anyways, but, uh, the, <laughs> two, it's, two, it's, been, it's been in orbit for two years, and that's very recent for a satellite. Um, and uh, so this is what it looks like. It's, uh, the resolution is about four kilometers, each pixel is about four kilometers, so you're not gonna get, you know, you're not gonna get a street, uh, you know, a different pixel here versus across the street. You're gonna get, you know, a, a single pixel over four kilometers, but it's, you know, it's pretty good. Uh, you can get nice uh, variability. You can pick out individual cities, obviously, San Francisco, LA, and then uh, a couple of the cities in the eastern United States here. So we're, we're, what, what it's giving us is, is realistic. Uh, an issue with, with satellite data is they can't peer through, through clouds. So you, this missing data right here, this is a, a day in September, uh, this it was cloudy here. And it was actually a, a fairly sunny day so across the eastern, across the United States. So we actually got a lot of data here. Um, but uh, 
you know, so this, this can be helpful, but it's not as helpful as if we average over a very long period of time. And so here I'm taking a two-year average of satellite data. Um, I showed this in the, in the first slide here, but the, now I'll explain it. Um, so here's a two-year average of, of NO2 from, from satellite data, and now we can pick out each individual major city across the entire United States. Um, and then also you can compare the magnitudes. So, you know, for example, like Denver, the magnitude of Denver versus Chicago or New York versus Dallas example, for example. And so this is really helpful in, in quantifying, you know, where, where is our pollution coming from, but then also um, what, you know, from, uh, from a per capita standpoint, like how much pollution is coming from each individual city. Um, and so this is, this is quite amazing, <laughs> at least in my opinion, that we can really start to see some small scale features such as, you know, this is a river valley in Idaho, is where, where most people uh, live in Idaho and do the agriculture, and there's agriculture here versus the mountains. So you can actually start to see these nice little, these ratios between um, areas that have uh, emission sources and areas that don't have emission sources. Um, yeah, so I've been using this data here, let's just zoom into the Washington DC area, since I'm sure that's of interest to most of you. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so we can obviously see the, the three largest cities in, in our area, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and DC. It's interesting to see that the pollution in Baltimore is worse than DC. There's a couple of reasons for this, uh, uh, but I won't get into that now. It's also uh, interesting to see the Dulles Airport area, which is uh, a secondary maximum away from the city. So in previous satellite data that had very coarse resolution, you would just see a single blob of pollution coming from this area. And so that was helpful in knowing that you had pollution in this area, but it wasn't interest, It wasn't. Uh, uh, it wasn't resolving the, the spatial heterogeneity. So um, again, you can kind of see the, the, the I270 corridor. You can see I95 connecting the two cities. You can also see smaller cities, such as Hagerstown and Frederick. Um, so this is really exciting that we can quantify this this variability in such a, a small area uh, from from satellite data. So, um, yeah, I've been working with this recently. Um, and so I've actually quantified um, the emissions from these cities, uh, from actually three, three cities here in, in a paper just published, although I'm doing, I'm, I'm working on, on other cities and, and other areas, uh, applying this work to other areas right, as we speak. But for right now, this is what I've been pu published in the literature for these three cities, New York City, Chicago, Toronto. And I was able to quantify how much pollution is coming from these cities. So EPA is reporting the bottom up. This is what EPA reports. They, you know, take all the traffic data. They take all the, the data from power plants um, and, uh, and and then other sources, and they calculate. So what's being emitted, and this is the value for New York City area. And so that's what EPA is reporting versus what I am using the satellite data to quantify, and that's about 18 megagrams per hour versus what the EPA is. So in this particular case, uh, the EPA is actually overestimating what's coming out, coming out of, of tailpipes and, and emission power plant uh, stacks. Um, if we focus now to Chicago, it appears that the EPA's methods are actually quantifying the pollution pretty well. Um, again, we're seeing pretty good agreement between these two, which is good. And I also did this for an international city, Toronto. Uh, we've been working actually pretty closely with uh, Environment Canada. So they're really interested in, in seeing what's going on in, in that area. Um, and uh, yeah, so I see a, a top down using the satellite data, about 14 megamet per hour versus the, uh, the EPA or their reporting of, uh, their federal agency reporting of about 11 megagrams per hour. Knox, is the satellite probably no way to distinguish between the natural, mm -hmm. but the EPA's top bottom up approach would would not include the, the natural sources. Correct. So. Yeah, I I have a statistical method that filters out the, the natural sources, the background sources. So yeah, I, I'm not including that. Yes. Um, what's nice about using the satellite data is actually we can report the, the emissions. Um, very quickly, uh, you know, quickly is a relative term, but within a month or two of a satellite overpass, you can take some calculations to do this, but, um, but we can release these estimates fairly rapidly versus um, EPA, they t actually can take them two, three years to release emissions data. So just having a, a very quick <coughs> estimate of, of what's coming 
from the cities can be really helpful to regulators to see, well, how is this year's pollution versus last year's em emissions? Um, so that's really helpful for, for, um, uh, for a lot of uh, regulators, but also uh, forecasters, for example, who are trying to estimate uh, the, the pollution, the forecasting pollution. Um, the, there's a couple of disadvantages, and because it's kind of a rough and quick, quick calculation, um, these these estimates are aggregated over the entire city, so we're not going to be able to distinguish, say, you know, cars are in particular overestimated, or or uh, industry or like construction or, or vehicles are, are are responsible. That the satellite data cannot do that. And then the, also, if if there are discrepancies, for example, in the case of New York City, it's hard to ascertain why that's the case. Um, and so, of course, this is just one step in a larger you know, research topic of trying to quantify what's going on with air pollution emissions. So, uh, perhaps you're wondering, how do you know that my method works? Um, so, that you might be thinking about that. And I'll just, I'll just put this up here. Actually, it works very well uh, when we look at power plants. Um, and so, power plants have, have monitors on their stacks, and they quantify the emissions of air pollution very well. It's of course, required by EPA. But, um, and so, for example, this is a power plant in New Mexico, this is a power plant in, uh, in Montana. I'm taking a very isolated power plant so that we know that the satellite data is quantifying only that power plant and no other sources. And so, uh, for example, this is the reported uh, emissions from the power plant, and this is what my method is showing. So, uh, with agreement within 10 to 15 percent, for this particular power plant complex, and actually under 5% uh, agreement for that for the, the power plant in, in Montana. So um, certainly, I, I think, and this is, is really attributed to the satellite data itself. I, I mean, uh, of course, I, I think my method is good, but it's really because of the satellite data. Um, the satellite data is really amazing. The, the, it's actually, the product is released by uh, the Netherlands Meteorological Institute. And they've worked for five plus years on this particular algorithm. So this algorithm is, is really great, and um, a lot of um, a lot of the if you want to say, say the satellite data is good, uh, give them your your props. So, so. All right. Um, another thing that we can look at when uh, a satellite data is to compare the weekday versus weekend uh, emissions. Changes so as you might know, as you, I certainly, I certainly know, is traffic, car traffic is going to be much worse during the weekdays versus weekends, and the satellite can see this, and it's pretty cool. Uh, we can see that the emissions on the uh, on the weekdays are approximately 40 to 50 percent larger than the weekend, and this is mostly due to car traffic, um, and I I can get into that as to why, but but. Um, how we know that, but it's interesting that this actually agrees with what the EPA is showing pretty well. So, um, so this is one area where the EPA is reporting that emissions are about 40 to 50 percent larger on, on the uh, weekdays, and we are using the satellite data to confirm that, so that was interesting. Um, another thing that we can do with the satellite data is actually estimate carbon dioxide emissions, and these are anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. It's hard to quantify actual CO2 fluxes. That's a whole different uh, research topic. But here I'm just quantifying um, carbon dioxide emissions. So the way that we do that is uh, we know that every for every um, a mile a car travels, for example, you know we know approximately what the ratio of NOx to CO2 is. And we can, we can aggregate that over the entire metro area. So there's cars, there's power plants, there's other construction vehicles. And so we have this ratio, it's called an emissions ratio, this NOx to CO2 emissions ratio. And we can um, then use that to convert from NOx to CO2. So here, here's NOx, uh, nitrogen, dioxide, nitrogen dioxide emissions. Um, and here's the, the dotted line here is what's reported by the EPA and the black is reported by uh, my analysis, and um, you know there's going to be a lot, a, some some discrepancy. You know, there's a lot. Of, this is using an older satellite data set, which has a little bit more noise and um, is not as as highly calibrated. 
But I think the, the interesting part here is to see where, where there are large discrepancies. So here, you know, there's, there's some differences, but it's really within the, the error of the analysis. But in this particular time frame, that's where we think that the satellite data can be really helpful in suggesting, that, you know, we really need to relook at the emissions inventory in the 2011 to 2014 uh, time frame to see is, e is the EPA doing this correctly. And, and this is for <coughs> my opinion here is I, I don't think that the EPA really accounted for the uh, uptick since the recession. So we know the recession occurred in 2009, 2010, and so that's why we're seeing this decrease. And then we see an increase due to the economy coming back uh, to, to a higher level, and then we see an increase in NOx, but actually the the EPA is suggesting that the NOx is going down. So I think this is an area where the satellite data can be really helpful is, is determining where there are large discrepancies. And so it's not only in the NOx data set, but also in the CO2 emissions data set. And so that's really the important part here, is to, to show that the, the estimating of the NO2 from the satellite data can be helpful for not only NO2, but also for uh, get quantifying our emissions of uh, carbon dioxide from cities. All right. So this is my last slide on NASA satellites, and I'll show you. There's some more NASA data in a second, but there's a new NASA satellite that's going to be launched in about two years now, called Tempo, and this is going to be. It's going to have a, a swath across the entire United States, and it's going to take measurements um, at least once an hour, if sometimes uh, more often than that. And uh, this will be able to show the emissions uh, throughout different hours of the day. So the previous satellite uh, that I was talking about just takes a snapshot in the early afternoon. This is going to take a snapshot in the very early morning hours, as well as the late evening hours. And so we're going to have a nice uh, uh, quantification of, of this pollutant of NO2 from, uh, during all hours of the day, during the every day. And this is uh, great for a number of reasons, but actually I think the, the biggest reason is due to clouds. So um, mid-afternoon is really when we get a lot of clouds around here, especially during the summertime, and so that obstructs uh, an accurate retrieval. And if we get, say, a retrieval at 12 p.m. when there aren't as, quite as many clouds, um, this can really be helpful in getting data every single day. Um, I just also want to quickly mention GEMS, which is being launched by the Koreans. And, uh, which is nice because not only is it going to get Korea, but it's also going to get uh, all of China and some parts of <coughs> India as well. So a lot uh, where the air pollution is really bad, we're going to get some uh, daily estimates uh, or hourly estimates from, from that satellite. So that, I think that's being launched uh, either next year or in <coughs> All right, so NASA is, is mostly, uh, you might think of NASA as launching, well, humans into space or satellites into space, but I'll, actually NASA also flies aircraft to essentially simulate satellite data. Um, and so the biggest, one of the biggest aircraft campaigns uh, ever in this area was called Discovery AQ. Uh, did I put the acronym on there? No. Uh, but uh, it's deriving air quality, deriving something from air quality. <laughs> Air quality, so you know the first and the last. Um, anyways, uh, uh, the the red is, is the actual the flight path over the the area. So they flew this airplane called the P3B. It's about the size of a 737 aircraft, and it had uh, 20 at least 20 different instruments on the air on the plane, and it also flew a couple other smaller aircraft on um, at higher altitudes. Um, and so the red is the simulating the flight path. So it actually did uh, what's called spirals over individual locations to quantify how much pollution is within the column of the satellite, the column of the, uh, of the atmosphere, to simulate a satellite uh, data set. Um, and it did that for several locations, and they had lots of ground monitors. Um, let's see what else. There, yeah, there's a, there's a whole array of things going on here, but I'm actually going to focus on this part right here, the uh, ship. And so um, it's really... They're, they're really wanting, one of the research questions, that, they have many research questions, but one of the research questions is how well do satellites observe pollution over the oceans, in this case the Chesapeake Bay, um, because that's, we don't have any monitors just sitting out in the Chesapeake Bay. So we really want to know, is the satellite data accurate in these regions? Um, we have models that predict 
air quality. And so these models, I ran one of these models during my graduate school time, and these models predict higher pollution over the these, uh, inland uh, uh, water bodies. So for example, Lake Michigan, um, Lake Erie, Long Island Sound, and the Chesapeake Bay, all these air quality, all air quality models are um, that can resolve these small features can are showing higher ozone concentrations, so air quality, worse air quality over over these water bodies. And is this actually true? Um, there are actually very few studies, if any, uh, that actually went out with a monitor to these areas. So I was on the ship that took these measurements. So we were based out of Annapolis, Maryland, and we uh, we. We you went on day cruises, so it sounds more glamorous than it really was. <laughs> but uh, every day we'd go up and down the Chesapeake Bay. It was pretty hot and humid it was during this during this this the middle of the summer, and um, and we quantified air pollution. And so the black bar here is what we found from the boat, and the red bar here is the closest site, which is generally uh, about right there, um, and. Yeah, there it goes. Um, we found this is actually only 10 days. Uh, There's only so much funding to go around, so we only did this for 10 days. But during this 10-day period on land, which was just again just just up over here, uh, there was no days where it exceeded the the air quality standard. But just over the you know this is 10 kilometers maybe 10 kilometers away, there are actually four different days where the air quality is exceeding the standard. So uh, this is very clear evidence that the air quality is consistently 10, this is all just as percents for you, it's about 10 to 20% to, to higher over the Chesapeake Bay versus uh, over land. And so this is really the first that we first study to quantify this uh, for this particular region for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, Interestingly, I'm getting a little bit into the science here, but I, I think this is interesting. Why, why is this the case? Um, and it's actually due to this discrepancy during the, the afternoon. So during the, the morning, the actual production of the air, as you remember, ozone is a secondary air pollutant, so it needs to be produced in the morning. So it's produced in the morning with sunlight and, and, the, and the emissions, and then around 2 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon, there's a very clear divergence. So um, in the, in the uh, land areas, the air quality gets better very quickly, around 4 to 5 p.m., but over the bay just stays poor throughout the evening hours. And so, if remember, the standard is an 8-hour average. So if we take an 8-hour average of this versus an 8-hour average of, that, of uh, the bottom line, we're going to get very different values. Um, and so, um, yeah, I've, I've spent reasons trying to quantify reasons why is this happening. So again, it's been confirmed, but the reasons for this high anomaly is actually, there's, there's three main reasons that we hypothesize, and there's been work since to, that's confirming this, but first is the, is the weather conditions. So I won't get into the details here, but there's specific weather conditions that occur over the Chesapeake Bay, <coughs> such as more sunlight, um, that cause the ozone to be produced more rapidly. Um, another reason is that there are slower removal rates. So I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier on, is that ozone is, can be removed by sticking to plants. And so when uh, there are no plants, then the ozone will just stay in the air uh, longer. And then also another thing that's really been being investigated currently by the Maryland state government is quantifying emissions from ships, both long traveling, you know, ships that are going uh, out to the ocean, but also ships like recreational. Uh, vehicles, uh, rec recreate what they call recreation marine vehicles. So obviously, you know, some the, these small small boats, but also you know, fishing and crabbing boats. Um, and why is this important? Well, I, I think it's pretty obvious why this is important. Um, you know, a lot of people hang out during the you know, on the Chesapeake Bay or on the Chesapeake Bay beaches during the summertime when this is the problem. So. Um, this is really an issue, and this is the issue actually that's causing Maryland to be in non-compliance of the of the air quality regulations. So um, this is really this is uh, the Maryland state government has put a lot of funding into trying to investigate why this is occurring and how we can uh, remediate it. 
All right, one last thing is that NASA satellite data can be helpful for, um, for uh, uh, assessing how well model simulations are doing. So remember the, the aircraft were flying around across the uh, uh, Maryland area, and, and we can use this model, model to uh, then train to the model to make sure that it's, it's running properly. And we've done that. And I'm going to skip over that part here, but a little bit. But then, once we have that model trained, we can then um, uh, see how well is the model simulating pollution, and in particular, tracking that pollution from state to state. So, again, I, I want to emphasize this: ozone is a secondary air pollutant. It, it reacts in the at it is formed in the atmosphere, and then it stays for a long time, a relatively long time, uh, long enough to trans transcend. Uh, uh, state borders. So, for example, the air pollution from Ohio will certainly make it to D.C., same with Pennsylvania, but if we say Maryland, it will certainly affect D.C., but it will also significantly affect Delaware and, uh, and New Jersey. So, um, it it's, should be pretty obvious, but we can't control air pollution on a state-by-state -state basis. This needs to be a federal, but even also global initiative to control air pollution. Um, and because it can, there can be non-trivial inter interstate transport or intercountry transport of pollution. Another cool thing about the model that I've been using is it can actually track individual sectors. So that was kind of that was something I was alluding to before, where we really want to know which different uh, sector or of the economy is a, a, uh, is contributing to our air pollution. For so here, there's some some terms here which I'll clarify. So at the top is what they call on-road and off-road. So these are uh, any type of vehicles that are driven. You know, this would also be any type of construction vehicle that's you know, driving off-road. Um, and so that's, according to the model, is the, the largest contributor to our air pollution in this area. Um, but we have, also have what's called non-road sources. So that would be like a, a lawnmower, or actually, in this case, what's pretty obvious here is the, the recreational marine uh, emissions here. So that's contributing substantial fraction. And also we have power plants. Um, so the power plants, they, their stacks are pretty high, so they actually have a longer, uh, a longer lifetime of, of their emissions. So they actually the ozone that's attributed to these power plants can be over a, a much wider extent. Um, so it's kind of smeared as opposed to something like vehicles, which the emissions are very close to the and, and affect relatively more local um, uh, sources. So here's just a, a snapshot for the Maryland area. One, one particular site um, is in Edgewood, just about 30 kilometers northeast, or 20 miles northeast of Baltimore along the Chesapeake Bay. So this is where the uh, air quality is the worst, in the, actually in this entire region. Um, and we can quantify here what's going on, so which sources, but also which states are responsible for pollution. So the black bar is, is, is the essentially the, the natural sources. This is what's coming in into our model domain, as well as some, some biogenic sources. Um, so that's quantified about 30 parts a billion over an average of, of 90, so approximately 30 to 40 percent of our pollution is cannot essentially cannot be controlled. Uh, but that means 60 to 70 percent of the pollution can be controlled. And which sources do we want to go after? Well, it's pretty clear from this that we want to go after the cars and the power plants, but also the other sources are non-trivial. Um, so it just shows, it gives, it gives regulators uh, a very good visual of where should we go after our pollution. For example, Maryland state regulators would be really interested to know that cars in the state of Maryland uh, are you know, about 10 parts per billion of 90 parts per billion, which is a, a non-trivial fraction. So controlling emissions from cars is definitely going to be a good strategy to reduce our air pollution. Um, there's some other strategies that maybe won't be, wouldn't be uh, uh, good to control our pollution. You know, for some of these smaller point sources, they're, they're important, but it might not get a great, a great rating for the buck uh, if they're going to control some of these smaller sources. So it's, it's really helpful in prioritizing where to go to. Um, last but not least, and, and from a, a policy aspect, we really want to know um, which pollutant to control. So as I alluded to before, 
Um, there are NOx, but there's also VOC, so nitrogen oxides or a volatile organic compound that can be controlled in order to um, produce our ozone. And what's very interesting about ozone, it has very non-linear, and you can see this is not a straight line. Um, it, it, it's, when you have very high concentrations of, uh, of both, uh, um, of say, NOx, but only low concentrations of, of VOCs, you actually, for every NOx molecule that you take out of the atmosphere, you will actually get worse air quality versus a very, very high concentration of NOx. Of course, that's not good because NOx, is, as, as Susan has shown in her papers, causes pediatric asthma, amongst other things. So we don't want to do that. Um, but this really is helpful in, in showing where along the curve, which pollutants do we want to uh, control, and, and, and how quickly do we want to control them. Um, and so it's really important to know where on this curve, uh, anywhere in red, this is kind of showing through the next slide, anywhere in red means that NOx is going to be the only pollutant that you want to control. Anywhere in blue, you want to control both NOx and volatile organic compounds. And so that's what I'm showing here is that anywhere in red, you want to control just the NOx, and anywhere in, well, green or blue, you want to control NOx and VOCs. And so this is really helpful for the state regulators in showing that, say, a policy to reduce both NOx and volatile organic compounds in Virginia, for example, especially southwestern Virginia, will not be helpful whatsoever, versus a policy to reduce NOx and volatile organic compounds in Baltimore will be helpful. Um, and so, uh, that's really what this this image is showing here, and this has been very helpful to state regulators. All right, so some conclusions here of what I've talked about here. Uh, so using NASA satellite data to derive air pollutant emissions from large cities and large power plants um, is, is possible, and it's actually very well vetted by scientific literature. I'm building upon many other studies here in what I've shown. Um, and, but I think what's really exciting is that these new satellite instruments, they give us the capability to develop emissions estimates from these smaller sources and for shorter time frames. So in particular, I was only averaging only over uh, a few months here, and we were able to, to estimate uh, NO2 concentrations versus year, uh, if we use an older satellite data, we'd need to use about three years worth of data to get the same data. So um, again, because of the missing clouds and also because of the, the larger pixels uh, of the older satellites. Um, with, when air quality monitors are trained by observations, especially NASA observations, um, these can be very helpful in constraining the model to, so that it can be useful in providing insight on sources of pollution, such as power plants and cars. And then finally, I think this is an interesting um, anecdote or interesting point for this audience here is that the worst air quality in our area here is actually in the Chesapeake Bay region and what and specifically the worst ozone. And the ozone is the is currently the pollutant that is causing this area to be in non compliance with the federal standards. Although as Susan would certainly point out, just because if we're below the standard doesn't mean there's no health effects from these pollutants. So um, it's important to note that you know this is the worst. This is what's causing the the states and the area to clean up their pollution. But it's um, it's good good to do that. And there's there's uh, many health benefits from cleaning up our pollution that are well extend well beyond uh, getting the attainment of the ozone standard. All right. So thank you very much.